Okay, welcome to the second in the seminar series of land and food. Um, excuse me for doing the short presentation on the people's land policy that some of you have already seen, but um, some of you may not. So we need to explain a little bit about what we're trying to do. So the people's land policy believes very strongly in the idea of land reform from the ground up. That means that rather than having some kind of think tank or top down approach that we're, we're, we're aiming to find out what people actually would like from land reform from the people who are actually involved in, in campaigns and different struggles. We know that land who owns it who has access to it, who makes decisions about it. It underlies all the issues that we're interested in. In this case, we're looking at food, but it's also important for things like the environment, housing, community, and recreation. So we're a project to develop discussion and debate about what kind of land reform we need. By bringing together a range of people to discuss land and the issues that affect them, we hope to contribute to the building of a broad-based radical movement for land reform. We recognize that it's not just a question of coming up with policies, but of actually building a, an actual mass movement for change. But that mass movement needs to have things that it can campaign around, issues that it, it can get stuck into that will mobilize people to actually fight for change. And our vision is quite idealistic in many ways, but we do see land as a complete ecosystem. This is how we should be approaching it. We should not just see it in terms of housing or food or environment. It's everything. It underlies all aspects of uh, society, including the, the natural habitats. We also have a vision of land as a commons, seeing it as a source of wealth that belongs to all and the, the, the concept of stewardship is quite important to us. We also believe that decision making must be fully participatory, dem democratic and inclusive. It's not a question of a few people at the top making decisions, but all of us need to be involved in how land is used. So what we're aiming to do with the, the PLP is to gather a range of ideas about what could be done. And then we put these into the PLP document. Some of there's a draft version already, but we've got a long way to go to develop it. And the whole idea is to work with others to campaign for change. So we have these seminar series. We had a, a seminar series on the environment last summer. And with these series, we're hoping to develop knowledge about the issues, discuss what needs to be done and come up with policy ideas. And food is a particularly important issue. Partially, you, as you can see here, 70% of land in the UK is used for agriculture. So what we do with land is an incredibly important question. What we do with about food is an incredibly important question. Also, as someone said at the Oxfordville Farming Conference, we're all eaters. It's actually something that everyone in the country should be concerned about and is concerned about. And we've certainly seen this during the pandemic and it impacts on everything, the environment, economic and social justice, and people's way of life and their livelihoods. In seminar one that some of you attended, we did look at the Agricultural Act. And even though there are some positive features, in particular for the environment, I think we concluded that it was rather inadequate for promoting and re rewarding small-scale agroecological farming. And good quality, affordable food. However, there are campaigners like in the Land Workers Alliance who are still working hard to change this. But at the moment, I think we feel that we need a lot more needs to be done. We need to know a lot more. We need to think about what kind of policies we need to develop and that we cannot rely on the Agricultural Act to bring about the changes to the food system that we actually need. So I'm pleased to say, to say that we have some very interesting speakers tonight who are very well informed about the issues. And tonight we're focusing in particular on the issue to do with land and how getting access to land is, a, is absolutely crucial for changing and the food system that we've got at the moment. So I'm now going to hand over to our first speaker, who's Oli 
from the Ecological Land Co-op, along with other hats, such as the Land Workers Alliance, who has been involved in trying to change this food system for many, many years. So, Ole, over to you. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks very much, Bonnie. Uh, thanks for everyone for coming. Thanks for everyone in the People's Land Policy for uh, setting this up. Um, I have been involved in land use sort of issues and campaigns in one way or other for about 30 years um, for my sins. And uh, I think I'll start with a positive, uh, very positive comment. I think there's more awareness now about land as, a, as an issue, as land as a resource and, and land as a system than there has been in any of that time that I've been active in that area. Um, and I think that's thanks to, you know, loads and loads of great uh, work that lots and lots of people are doing. Um, my sort of awareness or beginning of thinking about these issues uh, began um, in the early 90s when I was involved in some of the anti-roads campaigns in the UK and uh, I was doing a lot of uh, reading about ecological limits and limits to uh, limits on infinite growth and the need for a paradigm shift around what an economy would do and uh, the need for a sort of radical systemic approach um, to some of our ideas and the way that we treat uh, nature, resources, etc. And um, I don't think that my thinking has changed particularly in that time. It was clear then that we needed a, a systemic change and a really uh, a deep change in our approach. And I think that's still the case now. Um, I'm going to take quite a, a broad overview of some of the uh, of the situation as I see it um, in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail, too much detail about sort of particular policies. I'm going to um, look a bit at the sort of uh, physical situation around land and farms in the UK at the moment, uh, a bit of the political context, uh, just mention some of the activities that I've been involved in that address these. Um, a note about the way that the climate issue and the climate crisis intersects with land use as a, as a theory and as a, an ecosystem of ideas. And um, I'll end with a, a few ideas um, or pointers, I suppose, about the ways that I think we need to go forward. Um, so, so starting just with um, just sort of getting a picture of like what is actually happening in the UK at the moment. Um, uh, at a very, very broad level. I mean, this is such a complex and huge subject and I've got like a few minutes. So you have to forgive me. I'm going to be at quite a general level. Um, the UK is about 24 million hectares. Uh, a hectare is about one and a half football fields, if that makes more sense to um, some people. Uh, 17 million hectares of that are agriculture. Um, Three million hectares of forest. Uh, and the rest is sort of urban coastline marsh, upland mountains, etc. cetera. Um, according to DEFRA figures from a couple of years ago, only 165,000 hectares um, were being used for horticulture, uh, which is an unbelievably small level, um, considering the amount of uh, fruit and veg that we eat. Now, I'm not quite sure how they define horticulture, um, but I think that the, the point that I wanna uh, hone in on is that over half of our agricultural area is grassland, and a huge part of the rest of the land is cereals, is for the production of cereals. And that means the vast, vast majority of our land use in this country um, is controlled by agribusiness and is producing uh, animal feed, grassland and um, cereals for a very uh, agribusiness and profit orientated system. Um, so we've got a long way to go to change uh, the overlying uh, makeup of how land is used. Um, a consequence of that, of the way that land is, is broken up and used, um, is that we import a lot of our food, um, somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of our food is imported, about uh, five sixths of our fruit is imported, half our vegetables, um, although we do export a lot as well, and we export a lot, even though we import a lot, um, so that we can take part in the global economy, and there's lots of business reasons and detail we could go into there about why we import and export both about 350 million pounds worth of lamb and whether that is a sensible way to be providing food for people. Uh, and there's numerous examples like that across cheese, meat, um, cereals, etc. Um, in terms of farms, um, we've been slowly losing or reducing the amount of farms in this country since about the 1950s. Um, there's maybe around 215,000 
farm holdings in the UK. Uh, I'm using DEFRA figures here. I, they, I'm sure they don't include lots of things, but very roughly about half of those are in England. So about 100,000 farms in England, uh, a few hundred thousand people employed or working as farmers or farm workers on those farms. Um, there's been a process for the last 50 or 60 years of consolidation and monopolization in terms of farms, farms getting bigger. Um, we've lost over a fifth of our farms in the last 10 years and particularly in the at the smaller farm end. Um, I'm sure a lot of this is familiar to people, but I'm just giving an overview, uh, maybe for people who don't and as a, the context for some of the things we're going to go on to say. Uh, the average age of farmers is, is around 60, certainly in the late 50s. Um, it's extremely hard to get into farming if you don't come from a farming background or a farming family. Um, and some of the work that I've been involved in in the last few years has been geared around making it easier to do so. Um, so looking at the political context um, that we're in, uh, obviously ownership of land in this country is incredibly unequal and Bonnie referred to it earlier and I'm sure lots of people are familiar with some of the figures around the percentage of people that own half the land in the UK. Uh, and that obviously goes a long, long way back into history um, through feudal times, the Norman times and beyond. Um, and the aristocracy still hold a surprising amount of land in this country. And it's surprising that there is so little debate over that uh, issue. They've been very successful at clamping down on that debate as a political issue. But I think it's really, it's important to remember that there have been times not so long ago when land was a really big political issue and particularly around the turn of the last century, turn of the 20th century, when there was a lot of debates about land value tax and different ways of uh, equalizing uh, the wealth around land and the power that the land gave. And I guess I think um, part of our role as um, activists and people who are involved in this world is to make uh, land a sort of political hot potato again and to try and at least get back to that level of debate because um, we're not even there unfortunately yet. Um, we're obviously in a, we're a global uh, trading nation in an industrial economy. We don't produce a lot of our raw materials in this country. We are, our general uh, policy is we're gonna export finance and capital and we're gonna import our food and our clothes, and our materials. And uh, you know, for my money, that's not a particularly great um, way to do things. And it obviously has a very intimate and intricate connection with a whole history of colonialism and imperialism and racism that is still, very prevalent in mainstream politics and the mainstream narrative around empire and the role of Britain in the world. Um, why has land reform been so difficult over the last hundred years? And I think it's fair to say it has been difficult. It has become a very, it has been a very hidden issue. Um, I think there's a number of broad things that play into that and that make it hard. Uh, we are predominantly an urban population in this country now and have been for a long time. So there's a certain level of disconnection from nature and from what are seen as rural concerns and rural issues. Um, we, have a, we have a very dominant um, narrative in mainstream culture that being connected to the land and farming and growing food and producing raw materials is somehow backward, that the peasantry are stupid, that people who work with their hands are are doing it because they can't do anything else because they haven't made progress to sit at a laptop the uh, archetypal modern success and um i think even even in wales and certainly throughout europe um there's a much stronger um cultural meme that small farms are actually a backbone of a country that they provide strength that they provide stability security that there's a connection um, there to production that we have really lost in this country. And I think uh, a lot of uh, what we have to do is at, uh, at this broad cultural level of trying to get back to, to that kind of connection and that kind of situation. Um, there have been various attempts, obviously, to deal with the inequality of, of land access and land wealth. Um, and we have an inheritance tax system that is supposed to deal with that to some degree, but it has obviously been completely um, got around by the people with the money to do that and so we still have the Duke of Westminster owning all of Mayfair with its nine billion pound uh, value sitting in various uh, trusts. He's this, I think the current Duke is the seventh Duke uh, even though the rest of us are faced with a 40% tax on, on an inherited estate but somehow nine billion gets around it every, every time and I think you can't look at land access and land issues unless you address the way that 
the tax system and loopholes are allowing people to get around that. I mean, and for, and for my money, if we had a vibrant political movement, we would just be um, taking hold of some of those estates and saying the value of that should go to the people of London or the people who are growing food. And we're going to extract the rent from those properties and use it for social benefit, not for the benefit of one particular family who was handed land uh, three or 400 years ago. Um, we still have a very secretive land ownership system in this country. The land registry is neither free nor, nor covering the whole of the country. Uh, and that can be rectified without too much difficulty if there was political will. And we also obviously have a situation where land is, is now a, a source of speculation and an asset. And um, there's one figure that the value of land has gone up by 544% in the last 25 years. So it's been astronomical uh, growth in the value of land. Uh, and that has obviously played into the um, value of ho housing and why housing has become so difficult and expensive. So and a lot of those things are systemic issues. I guess they're not, they're not issues that I think can be easily addressed by just one particular policy tweak. Um, they are quite a broad political cultural level. And that's why I think we have to have a very, uh, you know, we need quite a deep systemic change in the way that we're looking at some of these things. Um, just so to mention a couple of things that I've been involved in to address these, um, I, I suppose it, I was really, it was really brought home to me the difficulty of managing land in a sustainable way when I was working in a small woodland business in the early 2000s. Um, and I realized there was basically an inverse relationship between the sustainability of our operations and the amount of money that I could make, i.e. the more ethical and sustainable I made the woodland management practice, the less easy it was to make any money and, and, and be in a viable business. And I think a lot of people who are in ecological farming or small scale forestry or, or even a lot of crafts will, will relate to that. Um, as for a whole host of reasons to do with the economy and particularly to do with planning laws and the way that um, it was so difficult to live at or on your place of work if you were involved in land management. And partly as a result of those experiences, I helped set up the Ecological Land Cooperative about years ago, um, which is a social enterprise, make it um, easier for people, new entrants, people from non-farming backgrounds to gain access to land uh, and to make and to make that affordable. And uh, it's been it's been slow and steady, I suppose I would say. Uh, we, you know, we're here, we have a number of sites around the country, um, but it's very difficult. It's extremely difficult to break to break the chain of policies and issues that, that have made it so difficult over the last 100, 200 years. Um, in 2013, I was part of a group of people that helped set up the Land Works Alliance um, to be a union of ecological land workers of, uh, and particularly to, to look beyond just farmers, but to look at forestry and fiber producers as well, and, and all sorts of people who are working with the land and to say we needed a union for those people to help us network for solidarity, for social and training purposes. Um, and because we wanted to build a social movement um, that, was, that was strong and that was also connected to the global movement of peasants, um, which is Via Campesina, uh, La Via Campesina, who are a global union of around 200 million peasants and indigenous people um, with unions from many, many different countries on pretty much every continent. They do amazing work. Uh, and we wanted to have a union in, in, in England, particularly uh, in the UK, there was the Scottish Crofters were members when we set up, um, but we wanted to be part of that sort of global movement. Uh, and I guess it had two prongs, and it still does have two prongs, uh, which is to build to build that social movement um, with a systemic approach, and also to campaign for policy change to make uh, life easier for people who are living and practicing farming, ecological land management um, at the moment. Um, and then subsequent to that, there have been other various other events, some of which have sort of led on to people's land policy, the, the Land for What conference a few years ago, and the people's land, uh, people's food policy, which a few of us did. So things beginning to try and bring this land issue into the um, into the light and into the awareness of a lot more people and make it a bigger political issue. Uh, how am I doing for time? I've probably only got a few more minutes. Um, I, yeah, I mean, in the last couple of years, I've been particularly looking at the relationship between land and the climate crisis. Um, and a hugely 
complex issue uh, on its own. We could spend hours talking about that. I'd love to spend hours talking about that. Um, you know, I don't, you cannot resolve the food crisis and the climate crisis that we are in without having a land solution. But to me, that is very, very clear. Um, and it's, um, it's crazy that there's not a stronger debate and a stronger narrative about how we manage land and how we use this key resource. Um, I, I do think that we can use natural solutions and uh, natural sequestration techniques to, to get to a, to a net zero um, situation. Uh, and I mean, by net zero, I mean a mathematical equality between the amount of greenhouse gas emissions and our sequestration levels, not a corporate plan to continue burning fossil fuels with a bit of greenwash on the side, which unfortunately is how some people use the term net zero. Um, but it's going to be very difficult because there's a lot of real challenges towards to, to making a system where people have enough healthy food, where we are um, soaking up our carbon emissions and where people have access to land and those are issues around the yield that we get when we stop an industrial conventional system the need for more forest area to to soak up emissions um the need to stop importing so much timber um and stop various imports that are causing damage that we need to stop farming on the best quality peat land which is unfortunately also our most fertile farmland because peat uh, is emitting a lot of carbon and it needs to soak up carbon um, and uh, and develop short supply chains, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so I think there's a really there's a really um, good and deep debate there to be had about exactly what um, trade offs we make to get to that system. Um, so finally, um, just in terms of sort of ideas or thoughts about how we go forward, um, yeah, like I said at the beginning, I, I mean, I've got there's a there's a whole long list of policies I could list off. I think would be good, but I think Duncan is going to talk a bit more about policies at the end and. I think we may be more useful just to talk at a, at a broader level. Um, the amazing thing at the moment is just the incredible range of people and projects that are going on that are addressing all of these issues. I mean, it's really staggering, like, and if you were at the Oxfordville Farming Conference or other forums where you realise how many people are looking to do this, that is really inspiring and brilliant compared to even five or ten years ago, in my view. Um, the, the other side of that coin is that that's a good thing because the crisis is pretty serious and pretty urgent. Um, and obviously people are suffering and dying right now from the way that our food system works all around the world. Um, and we're already committed to huge changes that we're not even beginning to really talk about the social implications of which in terms of food and movement of people and so on. So, um, but sort of broad things that I think are important are that uh, it's up to all of us to find ways to develop a relationship with nature or, or some productive enterprise, because I think it's important that we build that a sort of systemic approach where we are not all dependent on a trading system for our products, but we understand where they're coming from and the trade-offs that are necessary in when we're going to have to deal with some of these questions. So we sort of build our familiarity with ecosystems and with nature and how that can be both productive for us and leave space for nature. Um, and it's important to work out for us all where what we can contribute to, to a movement, like what our skill is and what our um, what our thing is that, that we can do that will help build some of the parts. Um, it's important that we connect to the one or more of the numerous campaigns that are going on uh, that are out there. And for instance, Land Workers Alliance has a sort of supporter category for people who aren't uh, land workers, but to try and build that movement of solidarity. Um, and we have to build a regenerative economy. And, uh, and there's lots of different ways of doing that. Um, but I think we do have to, we do have to engage with the fact that environmentalism for me in the last 20 or 30 years has missed uh, some of the has missed some issues because it's been about conserving nature out there separate to people and what we have to do is work out how to make nature produce for people but also have a, have space for nature to to do its own thing without the involvement and the interference of people and that is a real challenge that i think many of us are only really beginning to grapple with now um and uh, I'll end with by saying that I think crucially the thing that we, we need to get better at is, is how to work together better because there are numerous, numerous brilliant projects and things going on, but we're not all 
we're not quite pulling on the same rope. I, I think there's a there's a huge majority of people who are in favour of having healthy food, of local food, of dealing with the climate crisis, of having fair access to land. All of these things have vast, vast support, but yet we aren't managing to to grasp that and to turn it into a stronger uh, political force. And I, so I, and I think we have to ask ourselves those questions, like why isn't that happening when what we want is so obvious and so plainly to the benefit of everybody? Okay, uh, I've talked non-stop there for over 15 minutes. Uh, sorry about that. So I will uh, stop now and uh, hand on. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ollie, for giving us an overview and some of the political and economic context. Um, Sinead, do you want to come in now? Yeah. So, hi, um, I'm Sinead. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. My, my screen has changed. Um, I'm just going to switch off my video because it's lagging a little bit as well. Um, or try to. Um, but yeah, so basically my name is Sinead. Um, I grow at a place called Allside Farm, which is based in East Sussex. Um, it's an ecological land co-op plot. Um, so we got the land through them. It's a four and a half acre plot on um, ex-arable land and we are regenerating it to become a food and flower farm. Um, my experience is I've been growing for about four years now, so not a long time on the grand scheme of things. Um, I started on an allotment site on a community garden in London. Um, I started my career as an exploration geologist, so I've always been quite interested in land and the things that lie beneath our feet. Um, wanted to do something that was ever so slightly less destructive and be able to put something back into a system and that's what led me into farming um, and I previously worked in food policy that was kind of the first space that I got into when I started getting interested within food um, so I guess kind of short but sweet um, my interest in food kind of stemmed from two places um, it stemmed from realizing that so many injustices be it social economic and environmental were rooted in food and realising that actually my childhood was quite directly affected by those issues. Um, I came from a low income family. We didn't have a lot of like access to money and the food that I grew up on was quite heavily processed, um, unhealthy food, which at the time that was food that was marketed to people that are like our parents as being, you know, we can feed your child better than you can. So feed them this stuff. Um, Obviously, now we're in a different time and we realise that a lot of the food that we were ploughing into children at that time was not good. Um, so I guess I'm going to just kind of go into my experience of getting into food and the access to land and the kind of route into it. Um, and I, I think we're at a time where we really need to start talking quite openly and frankly about the lived effects of what a lack of supported access routes into this space actually does to people. I think often we concentrate on the policy, we concentrate on the lack of land, but we're never asking enough questions about what's actually happening to the people that are trying to access land and land-based work and the struggles that they're going through, be it mental health, be it physical health, be it um, financial sacrifices. And I think we need to start shining a light on that because unless we start seeing what's happening to people, we're never gonna move out of this kind of space where we're almost romanticizing the end point of having that access to the land I feel like I'm at a point now where I have become a landowner it's not a word that I feel very comfortable with using a land steward is better I guess um, but often that gets quite celebrated but actually my journey to this point was quite difficult and has been shared by lots of people and I don't actually think it's one to be celebrated and it's one to actually look at the challenges and start addressing those um, so I think there needs to be a much better, more supportive, more in inclusive, more compassionate way to get into this industry than one that's shrouded in so many sacrifices and, um, I guess not so good things. And if there's anything that I've learned over the last couple of years in particular, is that my, my experience is shared with too many people. Um, as I've talked about the things that I've experienced, I've realised that lots of other people have experienced it too, and that it disproportionately affects those that are from urban environments, those that don't come from farming backgrounds, those from marginalised communities, 
basically the people that we don't often see working on the land. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll do my best to keep it brief. Um, I'm making no promises there. I do waffle. Um, and this, this isn't really just an issue with growing. It's an industry-wide problem. This affects anything to do with, I guess, the environment and horticulture from food growing to flower growing to food policy. Um, and I'm hoping that Duncan in the next part of this has some of the answers. Um, I just, I'm coming with you to you with lots of problems and maybe not the answers. Um, but so um, hopefully you can see this, but I'm kind of going to try and just go through some of the issues that I felt I've experienced and other people have experienced over the last few years. Um, so the first place to kind of start is the reliance on unpaid labour. Um, now, generally, to get into anything to do with social justice, environmental justice, land work, there's an expectation that you will do free work and that you will volunteer or that you will do internships or you will do a traineeship and you will not be paid for that time. I remember years ago when I wanted to first get into this, somebody that was a senior at an environmental charity told me that you'll have to, to get your foot in the door, you're going to have to do, you know, the tea runs for a while. That's what I had to do. It's what you do. And this is the same with within food. It's a system that's either currently that's held up by either low paid labor or just completely unpaid labor. And for, I guess, an example, I applied for a traineeship at a pretty creme de la creme organic growing operation. Um, it was a year long and I was rejected, but not on the basis that I wasn't suitable. I was told I was suitable, but I was told that I wasn't suitable because I hadn't volunteered there before. And if I wanted to be considered for a traineeship, I would need to volunteer there for six months for free or add an extra two days a week onto an already unpaid two day a week internship to be able to be considered. Now for a 20, 24 year old working in London or living in London with rent to pay, how is someone supposed to be able to just stop working for four days a week to go and get some experience within something that they really want to work within? It doesn't create a good precedent. Um, and so that's kind of, I guess, something that a lot of people experience as well. A lot of people that work within urban food, food environments start off by working unpaid and they supplement that unpaid work with lots of part-time jobs which I'll go on to in a moment um so the next kind of big issue I kind of felt was this falling into a funding trap and the kind of then the idea of like scope creep of projects so I was fortunate enough to find a place to volunteer at um, I drive there after work um, I did a lot of work remotely for them for a year and then I had the opportunity to take on that project and that project business model is now what we use here at Allside Farm, which is essentially the only way that we feel like we can make it work for us financially here is to grow high value crops like edible flowers and cut flowers to then create a baseline so that we can keep food affordable. Um, that's kind of our first and foremost important thing to do. Um, so I took on that project in 2017 when the former person that was on that project decided, well, they were burnt out with it, they couldn't take it any further, funding had run out and they'd got stuck in this cycle where they were never able to actually work on the core social enterprise business because they were tied into so many different deliverables that were really far apart because that's how you get started. Generally, if you're starting a project, you apply for funding, you get tied down to a bulk of deliver deliverables and then you don't have any term to work on the long-term sustainability of a project so you get to a point where either you burn out because you don't have the time or energy to keep on applying for grants that are so competitive and you end up getting pulled away from the very thing that you were drawn to in the first place which is growing and you don't end up doing a lot of that um so then oh sorry it's gone on the wrong bit um, the next kind of issue was um, ideological issues and a lot of, um, I guess I'll be quite blunt, but I left audacious, or well, I shouldn't say, uh, I left the place that I worked at because I was essentially bullied out of it and I was deemed to be a commercial operation and essentially shamed for wanting to make money to pay for myself to be able to live. And 
the people that I leased the land off wanted us to be grant funded. They didn't want us to be, sell our produce to then use that to run the project that we wanted to do and to pay for the time for being there. And this is really, really common within this space, this kind of ideological clash between earning money and making money from selling things that you're growing or having grant funding. And the two never really seem to gel very well together. And I think we have to kind of start to accept and recognize that if we don't see the role of money within this space, it will only always be available to those who are in a privileged enough position to be able to work unpaid or for low pay. And that means depriving ourselves of so much knowledge, experience, wisdom, richness, because a huge range of people can't engage with this industry because they're just priced out of it. And the only way I was able to make it work for myself during that time that I was working on that project was through essentially burning myself out and making myself really, really sick to the point that I spent a year in therapy trying to put myself together after spending two years of basically, uh, in two years that I worked on the project, I paid myself a grand and a half. Any money that we earn, I put it towards volunteer travel or sending them on courses because I didn't have the capacity to train people, run a project, run a business and deliver produce across London. And I was in a place of working on three part-time jobs. I would get up at five in the morning, I would harvest, then I'd go back home. I'd go to my office job at midday. I'd do my eight hours at my office job. Then I'd go back home. Then I'd do an online software job and I'd work until midnight. And it was at a point where I, you know, I wouldn't eat because I didn't have time to eat. It was a waste of time. I needed to work. I needed to earn money in other ways to supplement the lack of money that I wasn't allowed to make in growing. Um, so that's kind of a, a huge issue around this, this I, I suppose, yeah, this issue around money. And that's what it all comes down to. That if there is not, if you don't have capital and if you aren't able to support yourself within this space and you can't access this space, not in a healthy way, you end up doing it in a way that leads to burnout. And I've spoken to far too many people that it comes to October every single year and growers are completely burnt out and then spend the rest of their winters, I guess, recovering. And then they go and do it again from the spring. And it's just the cycle that keeps on going and going and going. And um, I guess the next thing is kind of around the idea of security. Um, a lot of a lot of land work, especially in urban environments and if you're renting land off a landowner, it's really difficult to get a lease that's longer than five years. Um, I think it's if you go over seven years, you start getting into a whole different realm of policy. Um, Duncan might be able to speak a bit more to that. Um, but basically, if if you're never able to get any clarity on how long you can stay on a patch of land or how long your project might last for, there's only really one so much that you can physically do for that project. There's only so much that you can do in terms of the long term, long term thinking and the long term planning. And it also just disincentivizes people to why would you put so much energy into something when you have no idea as to whether you can still be there in a year's time because the contract that you've got is only one year. Or in my case, which was an issue that I had, I didn't have a contract at all. So I didn't even know if I would be able to continue growing there the next month because I didn't have something on paper that I could then either go and use for grant funders to go and get grant funding or just that sense of security that I have job security. Um, and so I guess that kind of leads me on to like why what the ELC are doing is so important. We have a 150 year lease here, which means that I have the confidence to think long term. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not going to be here for 150 years, God, I do not want that. Um, but I can think about future generations beyond me. I can do things now that will help two generations away from me. I don't really know what the right word for that is. But, um, but that's something that's really important is actually giving people a space that they can get stuck into for a long time so that they can do some of the work that people are often not doing. Things like tree planting for someone to benefit from in generations like I'm not going to reap the benefits of that but I know it's important to do lots of people can't do that because they don't have access to land 
for a long period of time. Um, and I think, oh, yeah, I think I've just changed the screen. Yeah, um, I think we need to get to a point where we're basically, you know, growing itself, be it for food or flowers or trees, is seen as important, like the actual act of it. And I think until we actually start to realize the value of it and the value of what it does for people, what it does for our environment, what it does for social justice, what it does for economic prosperity and all of these things, we're never going to be able to kind of get out of this space where land is just continually held within a group of people. Um, and we have to, yeah, I think, you know, we have to be really bold with that and ask questions and also address, you know, people's personal journeys and how common these journeys are, how common it is for people to not be paid, how common it is for people to burn themselves out because they're trying to do lots of other jobs so they can do the one thing that they really want to do. And yeah, so I think that is kind of in a nutshell, um, some of the issues and challenges that I think we need to kind of start bringing to the table and talking about and addressing and moving beyond. That's, that's me. Otherwise, I'll keep on going. I realise that's 15 minutes. Thank you very much, Sinead. I mean, I think that gave all of us, especially those of us who have know nothing about food growing or any of the things going on with the food system, an insight into what it's like. And it's really important the way that you've really laid on the line what it is like and stop the, the problem of maybe over romanticizing. It also gives, gives us a way in to start thinking about well, what needs to be done to, to change the situation. Um, we thought we would have a, a short period for a few questions and answers for Oli and Sinead before we move, moved on to Duncan and more of the, the policy issues. So Alec, do you think you could take over with seeing if there's any questions anyone wants to ask for about the next 10 minutes, maybe before we, we move on to Duncan? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Everyone hear me? Um, I can try and organize some questions. If anybody has any questions for or your Sinead's, would you like to put them in the chat or you could also raise your hand, I suppose, and I can um, identify you from there. The chat's disabled at the moment. Yeah. It's back on. Great. Right. So, so, yeah, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to... I don't know, even, even shout out at this moment while we're waiting for some people to create some messages. I've got a question. Yes. Um, hello, my name is Talis. Yes, hi. Um, it's a question for Ollie. So he mentioned setting up the ecological land co-op was really difficult to break the policies um, that make it so challenging. I didn't. I just didn't really understand what was that was all about. And I'm asking because I'm working with a social enterprise where we want to do the similar thing to actually buy land and then lease it to uh, farmers. So I was curious about this statement about how difficult it is, how difficult it has been to set up and it, make the ecological land co-op function well. Um, I guess there's a few different aspects to it. Um, one is, it's difficult to raise finance um, because uh, I guess it, uh, well, one of the root reasons for that is farming makes no money and therefore it's hard to make money out of farming enterprises. And we raise a lot of our money, well, we raise our money from two places, uh, private investment through community shares that we have to offer interest on and grant funding, um, broadly speaking. So if you're going to offer interest on people investing into you, you have to sort of make money and it's pretty hard to do that uh, in this in this area um, um, particularly as a new organization doing something fairly unique that is a bit out of the box and people you know it's not a normal thing to do people are not familiar with the setup or the structure um, the, part of the, the policies I suppose that I'm talking about particularly are, are about planning policy and that's around the restrictions around living uh, or, or, or placing new homes in the open countryside uh, in greenfield sites and we do that 
uh, because um, we think it's important people live on the land uh, that they're working on and farming. And if we can provide housing at a cheap enough rate, then people, it doesn't matter so much that the incomes from the farming or the forestry operation are relatively low. So it's the, how, it's the cost of housing that makes, um, that makes it very difficult to have a sustainable viable business from, from land work, you know, broadly speaking. Um, so we're trying to resolve that problem. Um, and their planning policy is very entrenched and there are ways through it around providing homes for agricultural workers. Um, but there are so many people trying to scam the system and using those, those avenues as a way basically of having a nice home in the countryside that it's extremely hard to prove that you are doing what you say you're doing. So I guess those are two of the key things um, I was referring to. Um, there's also various other issues around, yeah, just like what, what is the legal structure for an organisation doing this? How do we give security to both farmers and investors and local authorities who are looking at the planning system? So, um, yeah, there's a lot of different factors in it, I guess. Does, does that help a little bit? Yeah, a lot. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Dallas. Um, we had a question from Alana. Um, Alana, would you like to ask your question to Sinead? Alana, are you there? Oh, maybe the microphone isn't turned on, but I can, oh, not able to use the mic at the moment. Okay, so I can just um, read out the question for everyone. Um, Alana was asking a question for Sinead uh, as to whether as you know, of any other working groups that, or something similar. And also, um, Alana, you're saying that you're facing issues with access to land. We'd really like to somehow create land justice, returning land to people to create bioregional productions. Um, so I think it's really a sort of comment talking more about um, the wider community and that how that's accessing land and your experience again, Sinead, about um, how you sort of really get to engage and maybe sort of entered into the whole um, community in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I am um, in terms of like the first network that I kind of came across that really helped and also just really helped from like a mental health perspective of what was happening and that other people were going through this as well was the Community Food Growers Network. And um, they might be predominantly based in London and hopefully they're still going. Um, I haven't really like tapped into what's happening in London recently. Um, there's there's lots of kind of groups out there I'd say Lion, Land in Our Names are an amazing group who are you know asking the right questions challenging the right people and putting a voice like the, the person voice into a lot of these conversations and um, so I would highly recommend looking into the work that they're doing um, and the Land Workers Alliance as well like you know they're really at the forefront of a lot of this and they have a lot of regional working groups as well there's like networks of growers like we're connected to a South East growers group here um so yeah I'd say they're a really good like place for like an actual network of people with, working within this space sharing the same sort of issues to have a bit of a like rant about things too but also to feel held by a community of people too. Great thank you Chinese. Um we had a question from Eric asking about horticultural production in England. Eric um, are you about? Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess it's a question of for Ollie. Um, in terms of, in an ideal world, how much would we be producing locally, and how much land does that equate to? Because um, you said that it's it's a very small percentage of our land that's that's growing horticulture at the moment. Um, but what's the sort of target? And then from that. How much would it cost at today's market rates to buy that land? I mean, what you know, if you had a billion dollars pounds, what would you do with it? <laughs> um, I mean, it's incredibly difficult to give figures for like you know what uh, what amount of land should be in one particular type of production because it depends on what and what decisions people make. Is it more important to sequester carbon through the highest sequestering land use that we can have? or to have a 
varied diet to X extent, you know, so, you know, there's some, there's some complicated decisions and I think they can only be made in, really they should be made at, in, in the locality, in the bioregion, because people have, so that people can deal with the consequences of their decisions. Because at the moment we've got a situation where our system externalizes all the costs and we don't see the consequences. So we can make, you know, decisions without thinking, without thinking them through. I mean, for me, you know, millions of hectares of uh, land need to need to become uh, need, need to be managed under an agroforestry system where we're mixing trees much more effectively with other food with, with food production systems. Um, probably millions of acres more need to be in in sort of market garden type enterprises, which are which can produce a huge amount of food if you manage it well in a, in a sustainably intensive way. And you can mix a few animals into that system. You can produce a huge amount. And we don't I don't think we even begin to know how much we can actually produce from a piece of land if we manage it really well, um, because there hasn't been a huge amount of research and work going into that uh, in the last 50 years because all the money has gone into into making bigger tractors and into biotech you know so how how do we how do we build soil but produce the most amount of food whilst doing that i don't think we've even begun to scratch that surface um another pun um and yeah a, a lot more than we're doing in terms of horticulture a lot lot more and i would say that's all we need to know just like all we need to know is we need to do a huge amount more sequestration and we need to reduce our emissions drastically you know we there's like directions that we need to go in uh, and we know we can see where the changes are and that's more important than saying it's it needs to be this number of acres or that percentage um um, or you know exactly so many millions of tons of potatoes imported or exported because then people argue about the actual figure and I don't think we need to argue about the actual figure we need the change you know um, so and the change comes not by buying land I don't think in the long run that it becomes by by communities um, finding ways to get access to land buying is one way to do that but there are other ways and political movements um, around the world do that and we can take some lessons from them Great. Thank you. Brilliant answer. Thanks, Eric. Um, we have a final question before we move on to Duncan. That's from Ash Walker, and it's a question for Sinead. Is Ash, would you like to ask your question? Um, I'll just turn on my video quickly. Um, yeah, thanks very much for that, um, both of you, in fact. Uh, my question is, like, uh, basically, during uh, the uh, time at the, uh, the farm, if you... If, have you been uh, able to try and maybe encourage or enlist people to um, to join your um, your your challenge, basically for marginalised backgrounds? And like, is, has it been an option for them? Um, not not as much as we'd like to. Um, I think a big part of it has just been like the physical issue of this year. So we we've only been on this site for a year. Um, we moved here two days before lockdown, um, which kind of hampered a lot of stuff. Um, we've been like actively working with Land in Our Names, who are really great for kind of helping get people onto the land. Like, I think a big issue for us is location. Like, we are kind of in the middle of nowhere, and that in itself is a barrier for people. Um, one of the things, like, when we're kind of up and running again, what we want to do and what we did at our last project was basically like pay for people to come here and like support people if they have a financial barrier to you know, accessing land space and also not necessarily, you know, we've created areas on the farm that are more of just like an access to land space rather than like you don't have to come here and give something in terms of volunteering. If you want to have a comfortable space where you feel safe to enjoy some trees or just to be outside, come, it's fine. Like we're here for you. I think a lot of it's just like messaging and just like getting that out there and like constantly reassuring people that this is a safe place for everybody this is an inclusive space and we will always do everything to accommodate people as much as possible um i think that'll grow with time i think it's just you know a nature of it as being just a situation that we're in right now and and the outreach work of you know how do we physically get people to this place that is a little bit hard to get to but we'll we'll hopefully figure that out with kind of the next year that we're here thank you Denise. thanks Ash, for the question um should we move on to 
Well, Bonnie and Duncan's presentation. Um, no, I think we're on Duncan. If... Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's quite a big deal to follow Ollie and Sinead. Thanks so much. I uh, really enjoyed your presentation. And um, so the challenge here now is to say what I have to say without just repeating all the wonderful stuff that Sinead and Ollie says to try and add something extra while kind of building on all the, you know, all the excellent issues that they've kind of raised up, which, you know, are really complicated and tractable to solve, but that we really must. Things like the price of land, you know, how do we make it so that uh, land uh, is no longer kind of financialized asset and is, is back to again being kind of uh, the foundation of so much that we need in our society. We've heard the issues of rural housing, uh, how we expect people to go and grow things and be, be in rural communities when the housing options just aren't there. Uh, how do we value farmers and then how do we make sure that, you know, farming actually pays? I mean, obviously, obviously so many other issues are brought up, but I think that's a really... Um, you know, really, really important flavour. Um, but yeah, so just to give you a bit of background, so, so I'm a researcher for a think tank called the New Economics Foundation. Um, and so there I'm really interested in some of the kind of the big systemic foundational issues in the economy and trying to understand and unpick them. So I do a lot of work around things like money and how money flows through the economy, how it's created, how it works, and then how we might reform it. And then land is another one of those key kind of cornerstone, really foundational issues to the way our society runs. Um, and so I've taken a big interest in kind of trying to understand a bit more uh, and then understand obviously, given my kind of role, what kind of policies and uh, things should we be fighting for to create a better system? Um, and so the think tank that I work for, the New Economics Foundation, kind of our motto is to rethink economics, but we can think of wider systems as well as if people and the planet mattered. So we put thinking around people and the planet at the center of ours rather than the flows of money, which um, you know a lot of uh, a lot of people thinking about economics do. Um, so yeah, so my really work around land reform at the moment is really in two big areas. So one. Um, we're trying to bring together um, and kind of I'm just finishing off writing a big report for kind of the Scottish land reform movement, where we're trying to bring together what has been a really exciting um, a movement that has had some big wins up in Scotland, but ultimately um, is also lacking a kind of coherent set of demands. Um, so I've been working with them to kind of create, and again, it's, it's a massive report. We've got over 20 different kind of policy themes, over a hundred about recommendations. So obviously I'm not gonna try and go through them all, but we'll try and give a little bit of flavor for them. And there's some really exciting opportunities in Scotland with the elections coming up in May, um, that we could actually see some really interesting land reform and land reform really being on that agenda. Um, I've also been doing work with the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, which is another really interesting kind of organisation that's sprung up in the last year or so. Um, been given a you know, huge amount of money to look at this whole kind of system of food farming and the countryside as kind of one entity and, um, and, and really has some teeth to hopefully um, make some change that's possible. And so there I've really been looking at um, if we need to move to a more sustainable form of agriculture, um, which uh, the New Economics Foundation and the Food Farming and Countryside Commission are possibly unhelpfully uh, putting under the umbrella of agroecology as a kind of carry-all term. Um, and that is, uh, so agroecology, for those that don't know, it seems to be kind of the latest buzzword to use. Um, we use it as a kind of an easy way of so that we well, we could say agroecology and we and that includes kind of organic biodynamic regenerative uh, without kind of forwarding one of those at the expense of the others but obviously it does also have a very specific meaning you know it's a it's a it's a form of um of, of agriculture that kind of grew up in the global south and um, it has very important social uh, elements to it as well as as well as environmental um, uh, and so that's really important that we kind of think through that. But, um, but yeah, I've been looking at if we do want to move to a more agroecological system, which we do need to. And I think, you know, the other speakers have spoken about both climate change, but also, you know, uh, everything from the way we're degrading our topsoil to the way we're killing biodiversity. Everything says that we need to change the way we grow things. Um, 
how are we, you know, what, what are the financing needs? How do we accelerate that transition? So rather than being something that takes multiple generations, and let's face it, we just haven't got those multiple generations, how do we make this transition in maybe 10 or 20 years? And what are the needs there? So, um, so those are the kind of the two areas that I'm working in. I'm now going to try and kind of tackle uh, some of those, you know, um, both I think Oli and Sinead, you know, reference the kind of the concentration of ownership that we have in the UK and the fact that it's changed very little. Um, uh, and I know it's it's kind of easy to hold that idea intellectually in your mind, but I think that the actual figures just bear like just just um, um, just speaking out now because they are just so so shocking. So in the UK, in England, um, just twenty five thousand people own half of the land uh, of England, and that is twenty five thousand people that represents zero point zero four percent of the population, and basically own half the land. And if that wasn't shocking enough, because I've been doing a lot of work in Scotland, um, in Scotland, it's just 432 people own half of the land. And so that's 0.008% of the population. So, um, and in kind of international league tables, that puts the UK like close to the very, very top of the league table of kind of concentrated ownership. And there are lots of factors for that. There's a, you know, one of the reasons why we have the land system that we do is because we've never really had a proper revolution. We've never really tackled the in debt, like the, 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 the kind of the feudal structure of ownership that we dragged through from the Middle Ages all the way to today. Um, most other countries have had some kind of either a physical revolution or at least addressed some of these concentrations uh, of ownership in, in a variety of ways. Um, so there's a huge historic kind of injustice at the heart of land reform and a lot of land reform, uh, a lot of people engaged in land reform have had this kind of big historical lens to it. Uh, you know, in, in England, we like speak to the injustices of the clearances where common land was uh, kind of privatized and enclosed and, and, uh, uh, and local people thrown off and no longer able to use it. And similar things happening in Scotland with the clearances where uh, over time people were replaced with more economically valuable uh, things on the land like sheep or uh, people were displaced in order to do kelp farming and things like that. So there is a massive historic element to why we need to do a land reform. But I think what's really exciting and what's, what's the, 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 the change that's happening in the land reform movement is we are now adopting a much more positive forward looking reasons uh, and understanding of why we need to do land reform. So, you know, as people have, as, as Ollie and Sinead both talked about, you know, we cannot meet our net zero targets. We cannot really meet our climate obligations without rethinking how we use land uh, and how we do uh, agriculture. Um, we also can't really create the more equal, socially just society that we want um, if we don't tackle, uh, if we don't tackle land reform. Uh, we can't have vibrant rural economies um, if we don't tackle uh, land reform. Um, and so what we're developing now is a, is a very different one, which says that land reform is actually a prerequisite to the future that we want to see versus um, a lot of land reform talk has been about, uh, you know, to kind of atoning for or rectifying the, justice, the injustices of, it, of the past. Um, uh, and so that brings, you know, this kind of forward looking um, um, uh, opportunity uh, enables a lot more people to come along with us on the journey for land reform. And I think, you know, Oli has talked about how, you know, certainly in the last, you know, five plus years, um, there's been a really much bigger engagement with the whole uh, idea of land. Um, and I think partly it's as this narrative is changing and it's becoming something positive about the future rather than addressing something negative uh, in the past. Um, there are, um, and I think one other thing that definitely echo what Oli and, and Sinead have said is that, you know, you cannot do land reform. Uh, there is no silver bullet for land reform. There's no one, two little things that you can tweak in the economy so that you suddenly have a system that works for everybody, where land is priced properly, where you can have access to food, all of this kind of stuff. So you need to develop these really, if you want to do land reform properly, you need to develop these complex kind of portfolios of changes. Um, and, and that's often very, very challenging. So for instance, in my report, I bucket them under four big uh, areas. So one is the improved transparency. 
and I think Ollie mentioned it in his talk, uh, you know, we still don't know who owns uh, much of the land uh, in the UK uh, because it's just not registered uh, for whatever reason. And even when it is registered, it can be registered uh, with a tax, with a, with, a, with a company, and that company can be registered in a tax haven, and suddenly you lose all real understanding about who owns a particular uh, patch of land. It's also hugely expensive. It, it, it's not open, um, and it's missing loads of information. It doesn't tell me whether uh, there are any options on that land to buy it. It doesn't tell me if that land has received subsidies. It doesn't tell me if there's, you, you know, anyway. So um, there's a huge transparency problem, and 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 actually knowing who owns what is actually a, you know, such an important prerequisite to doing uh, a proper land reform. Um, the second big bucket is then reducing rent seeking. Now rent seeking is one of these a bit jargonistically economics terms. It's not about rent in the sense of like when you pay your rent to your landlord or whatever, but it's about the idea that for just owning a thing, you can kind of earn money without really doing anything and you're drawing in earnings from the rest of your community. Um, the, the kind of the telltale that, or the, the kind of the emblematic example is normally the building of the Jubilee line um, across London. And so there was when uh, a few years ago, uh, the London built a new tube line. It cost many, many billions of public money. Um, and what happened was, was that it, in every station that was built, within the square mile around the station, property prices rose immensely because obviously they had a new amenity really close by and so it became more valuable. And so what happened was this huge amount of public money got plowed into building a piece of infrastructure uh, and all it did was then get sucked into the property values around there. So all of those owners of property around those new stations were basically rent seeking off us using this public money um, and so there are a whole variety of ways in which that happens. Um, and so, uh, uh, and things like taxes, uh, so putting a land tax on or uh, changing agricultural subsidies, you know, those could all decrease the amount of rent seeking that goes on. Um, within absolutely in the third bucket, we need to redistribute both power. So with ownership of land comes absolute power, both within your local community, because you get to decide what happens on this land and more broadly because it gives you status and power uh, in the economy more widely. So we need to figure out how to redistribute that power, but also more importantly, we need to redistribute the physical ownership of the land. Um, I know there are some um, who think that, you know, it's, it's really about getting access to the land that's the most important, but I think that real ownership um, is really right at the key of that. Um, and then in a fourth bucket is then how do we enable the communities who live around land to make more sustainable and people-centered decisions about land use? And that's about thinking about things like planning and, and, and stuff like that. So it's only by addressing this really massively holistic bucket of things that we can really start to think about um, um, really changing the land system here in um, the UK. Um, so obviously I'm not gonna have time to go through kind of all hundred of the policy recommendations that we're going to make in this land reform report, it will be out in a few weeks time. Um, and so hopefully I'll be able to send it maybe via Bonnie to everybody here, but also just look out for it, it'll be coming up and hopefully um, we'll be get making some news. Um, I'm just going to talk about four quickly and then how they might impact kind of the availability and the price of land um, for agriculture and, and for new entrants and things like that, um, to try and keep it a little bit on theme. Um, so, you know, one obvious element that we've, spoke, we've spoken a little bit about is the idea of taxation. Um, if you go back to 1700, the UK government uh, received over 50% of its income from a land tax. Um, if you go to today, today it's at 0%. So in the intervening kind of 300 years, um, the, landed, uh, the landowners have managed to shift taxation from this... Uh, unmovable, really easy to identify uh, piece of wealth, which is what kind of land is. And have really over time, we've pushed it into um, income tax, you know, our earnings and our spending over kind of wealth. And you've seen this this year, so that wealth is no longer taxed very much and we've moved much more to earning and spending. And what those do is those shift the tax burden much more onto the average person uh, who, 
we, who the, us average people, we tend to have less wealth and we tend to make up more of our time in both income and then spending. Um, so it's been hugely unfair uh, uh, kind of distributionally. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so I think, you know, it's really rife time to, to rethink the tax, to rethink how we might tax land. Um, obviously now is not the time for an ins and outs of, of the idea of land value tax. Um, land value tax certainly has a lot of merits, um, but in the end, in the report for Scotland, we come down on a combined land and property tax uh, at, at a flat rate. So it just keeps on going at a fixed percentage, whatever the, whatever the, the value of your land and property is. Um, and, and the reason we went for a kind of property tax over a land value tax um, is that one, for all of the uh, for all of land value taxes, intellectual appetite, you know, interest, and there isn't many things. So my think tank would consider itself a kind of left-leaning think tank, the New Economics Foundation, but the Adam Smith Institute, which sits like on the absolute opposite end of the spectrum, also loves land value tax. And then somebody like the Resolution Foundation, like smack in the middle of politics, you know, also loves land value tax. Almost all economists love land value tax. Um, but for all of the kind of theoretical love that land value tax gets, it's implemented in vanishingly few places um, because it is because there are some complexities to implementing it, and there are some, you know, emotional hurdles to get over to implement it. So we've gone for this flat tax as a much easier to understand, uh, much easier to get over some of the valuation problems, things like that, and and the real benefit of a tax. One is to raise some revenue, obviously, from, uh, from wealth rather than from income and spending. Um, but also, obviously, it would reduce the price of land. At the moment, the price of land, one of the factors that makes it high is because it is re relatively untaxed. Um, and so putting some taxation on it would start reducing the price of land. The idea is also that by taxing it properly, you would also probably get some land put on the market because suddenly landowners would have an annual cost to holding this land. And so the idea is you would also get some. So rethinking taxation, um, and again, whichever one you choose, be it a progressive property tax, be it a land value tax, um, the real aim of the policy is really to reduce the price of land and to make more land available. Um, and, and so I think that's a really powerful one that you really can't do land reform without kind of thinking through that. Um, the second one, which is one that's happening in any case, which is we need to reform how we think about agricultural subsidies. At the moment, you know, about three and a half billion pounds. Uh, well, if you go from the last year that we paid the common agricultural policy, three and a half billion pounds went into the pockets of farmers. Uh, I only use uh, inverted quotes because it goes to many people who aren't farmers. So, for instance, in Scotland, um, if you, uh, so in Scotland, 18% of Scotland, I know we saw some of these figures about what, what land is used for. In Scotland, 18% of the land is used for grouse, moor, grouse moors, for grouse shooting. Um, it's absolute. Uh, and so this isn't natural habitat that uh, people are allowed to hunt in. This is intensively managed uh, uh, land to maximize the birds at the expense of birds of prey, uh, other animals, uh, the ecosystem uh, more widely. Um, and amazingly, if you own a grouse moor, you can even get common agricultural subsidies, provided you plonk a few sheep on your land. And the sheep basically are act to mop up the ticks so that the ticks don't land on the grouse. Um, and so just by having sheep on your grouse moor to mop up some ticks, you can get hundreds of thousands of pounds from the common agricultural policy. So we need to shift the common agricultural policy away from a, how much land do you own uh, into you know, a more like a public money for public goods. So if you provide some real ecosystem services, uh, then you know, we should hand out public money, but it should not be based on how much land you own, which is how uh, it's done today. And again, any reform of that common agriculture, of that subsidy system will again lead to a reduction in the price of land. Um, the only scary thing about changing the way we do common agricultural policy is that 40% of UK farms, and I'll, I'll try and, I think Ollie mentioned there were 215,000 farms, farm plots in the UK, in the UK, I think was Ollie's number from earlier. So 40% of those are only viable, and by that I mean like financially sustainable, because of the CAP grants, because of the common agricultural policy grants. So 
And this is part, this, these are why, this is how some of the questions of land become really, really taxing because you know something needs to change. We need to change that common agricultural policy because it is horribly distorting and it gives huge amounts of money to some of the richest people in the UK. But you also need to be very, very careful in changing it because lots of very vulnerable farmers are only succeed, only are only viable because of it. So you, very complicated to balance. And so I, I definitely have a lot of sympathy for those looking how to redesign the environmental land management scheme, which is how the new cap um, is going to be is going to be called. Um, God, I'm just talking way too long, and I haven't got. Um, so uh, one other thing I'll mention briefly because I think it's been it is. What we also need to think about the other, the other big bucket reforms is think about introducing planning into rural areas. So for the moment, the planning system is really mainly an urban thing, or as Ollie mentioned, as soon as you want to build some kind of dwelling, like the planning system comes in, and, um, but it doesn't really zone land for any particular purpose. And so the owner of the land then has a huge amount of power and agency to decide what happens there. But I think we can, we, given the challenges that we need to meet around climate change and other uh, and other things but not to mention flooding and you know there's so many challenges of the land that we need to mobilize land to help us with um we think there needs to be a real kind of extension of the planning system into rural communities um but not just an extension of the urban planning system into rural communities we need to think about planning differently how to get ensure people are involved um we, for instance, float the idea of a, of a kind of jury service for planning so that p local people would be compensated to be part of these processes so that it isn't just the well-funded uh, developers or whoever that can input into the planning process, that real communities have real time and that we recognise the value of that and, and, and pay people um, to join. Um, so that's really, really important around rural housing. Um, there's really interesting systems, for instance, in Norway, uh, where certain homes are designated either for permanent residence or uh, for uh, second homes. And if you and, and, and it creates a kind of two tier housing market in rural Norway. Um, but it basically ensures that there is afford always affordable housing for those that really live and work in local communities, but also that there's a second infrastructure that accounts for the holiday. And so they found a really good way of kind of merging uh, of, of the two merging. Um, but probably the biggest and the most, uh, the most contentious kind of policy idea that um, we put in the Scottish report, and I'll kind of finish there only because I've been just talking for way too long um, and, and hopefully there'll be some good questions that we can, um, that we can lead on to, um, is, we need some sort of, you know, so Scotland has been really good. You know, they've got their community right to buy. So whenever somebody wants to sell a parcel of land, um, the community has a right to come in and try and buy it from them. Um, now, uh, and the Scottish government, even in its, in its infinite wisdom, set up a fund so that communities could apply to this fund for money to then, uh, to then buy the land. That's fantastic. And indeed, from where we are down here in England, like that is such a huge amount of progress that it seems almost hard to imagine how we get here there in the UK. But um, in, from the Scottish perspective, having having lived it for a few years, they're now starting to see kind of the deficiencies in the system. So one, um, it only makes land available for communities if a laird decides they no longer need it. Uh, and so absolutely, it's not the prime bits of real estate, it's not the bits that the communities want, but it's, it's the bits that are just made available. Um, also, it's buying land off a laird at, at market value. Um, and so what you're seeing is a transition of public money uh, to basically, once again, some of the richest people in the UK, uh, most of the time who didn't ever buy the land, they just, you know, acquired it through through gift, and so why should again the public purse be compensating them at such high uh, at such high levels? Um, so um, it was felt that like uh, in order to um, force land reform to happen at a much faster speed, we need a mechanism to start the redistribution of land ownership that doesn't involve a landowner thinking they don't need it anymore. Um, and so in the report, we float the idea of a uh, of a cap on land holdings so that no beneficial owner or no legal owner can have more than X 
Now, we don't go as far in the report as to say what X should be. It should certainly be more than the total area of the country divided by the population. Like that's not how we should necessarily get to this maximum. Um, what we nudge towards is kind of, um, as, as, you know, as some sort of viable farm unit, something like that as, a, as the maximum. Um, and so what this does is this then creates uh, an immediate point that says uh, anything over this size will automatically be assumed that it's going to be sold on. Um, but we allow the landowner kind of a public interest defense. So uh, we can so that the landowner will be able to say, well, actually, I'm using this land to the best interests of the land and the local community. And then if it's found to be that's so, because again, in Scotland, again, where the focus of this report was, uh, there are actually lots of good landowners, uh, as well as lots of terrible ones. And it's really important to acknowledge that. And there are some communities that really love that, you know, really, um, really value the contribution that, that the local laird makes to the community. There are also obviously many that don't. Um, uh, and so, yes, so, and then if they, if they met that public interest test, they'd be able to keep that bigger land. But if they didn't, then that land would be sold off by what we're calling a compulsory sales order. So we'd be able, the landlord would be forced to put it on the market and then it would basically be sold. And the idea is that this would generate a huge amount of land going onto the market, which in a world of supply and demand would, would lead again to a reduction in price, which would again make access for uh, new farmers and all of it, you know, you know, so much easier. Because one thing that we heard, and this is the kind of maybe the bit that I'll finish on, um, is that that you know those wanting to access capital, which I think you know Sinead spoke about. Um, you know, it's so important that there's a way for uh, farmers, especially so they're you know those either wanting to transition or those wanting to enter farming, um, that they're able to kind of access affordable capital, affordable money, affordable loans. Um, but sadly, our our established kind of banking system, our established finance system does really badly at meeting the needs of farmers, and especially those farmers who are really gonna be the key to the transition. Um, and I'll just go through a list of kind of who our banks don't serve well to give an idea about, again, and what kind of really needs some massive reforms in the way that finance works. Um, so banks are really bad at lending to tenant farmers. So banks generally require some kind of collateral, some kind of thing, so, you know, that's why they love lending against housing and land, because they get this thing. And even if you default on your loan, they just get the land. And so they know they, they, they know they can't lose. So tenant farmers who don't own the land, find it very, very difficult to access capital, uh, access loans to either, again, transition or, 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 or manage the farm. Um, smaller farms um, also can be very, very challenged. Banks often find it uneconomical to deal with one small loan from a farm. Um, and so smaller farms and smaller farmers uh, tend to find it very, very difficult to access capital, again, from the banking system. And that's why they're fed into this world of grants and so on, which, again, can be positive, but um, can also be very, very difficult. Um, the financial system finds it very, very hard to lend to kind of new entrants or even succession farmers who have, who have inherited land because the banks want to see a kind of track record that you know what you're doing, that you can, that you can be profitable. Um, and even succession farmers that are taking over a farm, again, they won't even take the kind of the track record of the parent um, uh, the, uh, for the children. And then finally, as we're moving into new methods, as we're thinking kind of uh, innovatively around how we grow, um, you know, new types of agriculture, new methods, um, you know, the banks also don't serve that. So, you know, really, uh, are, uh, we're seeing a, a kind of a land system which is making land too expensive, way too concentrated, way too difficult to access. And then we're seeing a finance system that equally is pushing out and not serving all of the people that we really need to come into farming and agriculture um, to help us kind of manage this big, uh, this big transition. So, um, so that was quite a lot. Um, I hope I hope it made some sense, and uh, and yeah, I really look forward to some questions if there are any, or any clarifications as well. If anything I said didn't make uh, didn't make a huge amount of sense, well, I can really see questions coming up. So. Great, thanks, Duncan. Um, yes, we can go through some questions that have popped up. So, um, Eric, you have a question about Westminster. Would you like to raise that point? 
Yeah, just uh, Duncan, fantastic um, to hear your thoughts on land ownership and what you've done in Scotland. Um, how likely is it that the English will ever get a land tax or a property tax? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I certainly wouldn't. I mean, I think where it's where there are overtures to it being interesting is in kind of the business rate side. So um, here, land is taxed differently if it's for a business premises or if it's a, if it's a kind of your residency, uh, your kind of home. Um, and so there is talk about moving business rates more to kind of land value tax esque uh, modeling. Um, but no, I mean, you know, the last time uh, one of the major parties proposed something that, you know, that approximated this was, you know, during Corbyn's, one of Corbyn's Labour manifestos. Uh, and they were all over it. This was a garden tax, that it was, you know, they're coming for your garden. Um, so, um, so I think we're still quite far away from a kind of land tax uh, down here. Um, but ultimately the question of taxation of kind of land and property is becoming so acutely problematic uh, that, um, that I think we are gonna see a breaking point soon. Uh, council tax, which is basically the only way that we tax kind of residential property and land at the moment um, is so dysfunctional, is so regressive, there is such broad agreement that it is the worst tax that we have on the books um, that, well, you know, it's one of those things. It's just like, well, it's just like we're always expecting a property crash to be around the corner, but it never happens. It's the same with kind of council tax reform. It must happen. Surely at some sense, at some time, these politicians are going to see sense. Um, but every year that I think it's going to happen, it doesn't happen. So, um, so unfortunately, Eric, I don't, it's really, it's really hard to gauge, but I feel it'll be one of those things that when it does happen, it will happen very, very quickly and it will feel quite unexpected. But um, it feels like, you know, uh, what are, you know, my kids, we like to play, what is it, um, buckaroo, you know, with the donkey, where you have to like slowly put things on the donkey before it kind of bucks. You know, we're on that, the, the, the load is building up, the straw that broke the camel's back is soon going to be dropped on the camel, but when and how, it's just so hard to tell. Um, but again, what's also interesting about this tax is that yeah, you have these really unlikely alliances where you have like uh, really left uh, organizations, really right leaning organizations, really centrist organizations, all agreeing and saying it. And so, um, and that's again, what shows the entrenched power of the landowners, that there can be so much agreement about a topic, uh, not only the agreement about that reform is needed, but also agreement on the reform itself, and that is really unusual in uh, any policy area that I can think of that I that I work in. Uh, and yet nothing happens and nothing happens for decades and decades and decades. Uh, so it really shows you what you're up against in the land reform world and why so little has changed in a thousand years, let alone um, in, in kind of generations. Great. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Eric. Um, before I move on to other questions, I thought I would just ask um, Sinead and Nolly whether they had any um, response to Duncan's ideas and whether they wanted to add anything. Um, I, I mean, I, I, it would be great to have a chat with Duncan, but I think I, I've talked enough as well, so uh, just have to let other people uh, have, a, have a say. Okay. Oh, are we? Um, Sinead, did you want to add anything? Um, no, no, I just, I get yeah, everything that you say is is great a lot of this like goes over over my head and just i'm just here just trying to grow some grow some cute vegetables so, <laughs> thank you for doing the work duncan <laughs> well that's it we all have to work together at different stage you know different different levels of it um and i think that's what's so important and, and i think we are starting to see the coming together and i think you know when we brought together land for what and um, so i was also part with ollie and and, and bonnie obviously um it was really about trying to bring together all those different users and needers of land so that we could all learn a bit from each other <clears throat> that it wasn't that there isn't just one way there isn't just one way of looking at land um, and there are so many different competing uses for each bit of land that yeah it, it really requires a coming together to talk about it and indeed that was I think the most gratifying thing that I think came out of the that conference, you know, because we'd invited down lots of people from Scotland 
um, because down in England, you you kind of reify what's going on in Scotland and like, oh, at least they've got a movement and all that. And it was really, it was really interesting to see them come down and say, oh, well, we, you know, we never do this in Scotland, bringing together, you know, people who care about parks, uh, communal spaces, um, but also then obviously growers um, and then housing activists and bringing all of these different communities together to talk in one bit, in one place about what land is for, um, I think. Uh, and that's really exciting when that starts to happen, uh, I think, more and more, although obviously still a very, very long way to go. Great. Thank you, Duncan. Um, we have a question from Dana about land inheritance. Dana, would you like to ask a question? Um, hello, it's Stu, actually. I've not changed the name. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Duncan. Really interesting. Um, I was wondering, are there any thoughts about having a reform at kind of the volume of land that can be inherited? Because if you could put caps on that, that to me, that would be a fantastic step forwards. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, all th in thinking about caps, there's a few different places that you could put it. Um, and then obviously also when it applies, so the cap that we have could either in, in the report here could either be applied just from day one after the legislation is implemented, um, or it could apply at sale, you know, but, it, you know, and it, and it all depends a bit on how fast you want land reform to happen. If you want it to happen at pace, you make it, so from day one, anybody that owns more than X hectares needs to go through this process to see if they can keep the land. If you want it to go a bit slower, you make it when people decide to sell. Um, but you know, just to give an impression, the average Scottish estate is only sold every 122 years. So you get a sense that already making it at point of sale kind of extends it. Um, and then probably um, at inheritance is probably somewhere in the middle um, of those two kind of time frames. Um, but yeah, so but yes, we, we definitely need to see more inheritance. I mean, indeed, in Scotland, there is still um, a, a, a kind of law whereby all of the land of an estate goes to, you can only inherit all the land to one person. So a, a Lord can't, for instance, divide it up into five different inheritance. Obviously they can do things before they die, but yeah, the inheritance rules of land in Scotland are still very arcane um, and still kind of have a bit of this primogenitor kind of stuff um, about them. Um, also importantly, um, agricultural land, you know, land isn't um, uh, um, uh, subject to inheritance tax. So again, so agricultural land is exempt from that, which is again why a lot of rich people buy lots of agricultural land. It's not necessarily for the agricultural purpose, but to offset some of their tax bill somewhere else so that they don't have to pay inheritance tax. So uh, there's definitely a lot that needs to be thought about around inheritance. And certainly it's, it's one of the points at which you could put this like cap um, that says that you're not only, yeah, that you can't, you can't then distribute it in one, um, in one big pile. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Ollie wants to come in. Go, go Ollie. I, I just would, would sort of add something onto that. I mean, I really endorse that idea. I think a cap makes lots of sense, and I don't think you need to put it hugely low either to release huge amounts of land, because even if exactly. it was around one or 2,000 acres, some estates or so many tens of thousands of acres, that um, that in itself would be freeing up vast amounts of land more than you know more than we would know what to do with for a bit um, but the other thing that I think would be great to go alongside that is that every piece of land uh, of any size uh, where there's any kind of production or ecological aims on it needs to have a management plan that goes alongside it and I think it needs to be obligatory for it there to be that kind of plan if there's going to particularly if there's going to be any kind of public payment or subsidy to go towards it and that needs to be transparent so that the community can understand what the objectives are of the management of that land and people can judge and, and also report on whether it's being adhered to um, and that allows the communities to start seeing what's going on and what, what aims are um, and that can be tied into incentives so that if you've got a poor management plan you can be incentivized to increase it through the way that subsidies and payments work or, or disincentivize if your plan is basically carry on spraying vast amounts of pesticide over wheat crops for the next 20 years you know <laughs> and there will be some penalty for those kind of things so um, yeah Great. Thanks, Ollie. Um, we had a question from Matt about common ownership and the role that might have in how land is used properly or not. Matt, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, 
Okay, I'll, I'll if not, I will just take it because I think you've done a good job of summarising, Alec. Um, okay. But um, Matt, do come in at any time if you want to if you want to interrupt. But um, but yeah, I think you know common ownership is a really interesting one. So you know the commons that we have here in England um, is not is actually land that is owned privately. So all common land is actually owned by is owned privately, but it then we as commoners or the commoners because we aren't necessarily commoners for that land um we have then some rights over that land um so that's the kind of the the old form of common ownership that um exists in england but interestingly doesn't exist in scotland for instance um so working in land reform across england and scotland requires is quite complicated because things that you feel should be the same in both places are often very very different um but yeah common land is one of them but um but yeah i really um I'm a real big believer in, in what I'll call kind of collective ownership of land. Um, and so, uh, I mean, another big policy idea that I'm working up that I'm trying to find somebody to publish for, to publish it is that is for an idea where, you know, we all become the co-owners of all of the UK. Um, and so I've got a whole plan about how to do that, what we're calling the people, what I'm calling the People's Land Trust, so we would all become common owners of the of the, all of the land. Um, I think those things are hugely powerful. Um, I think um, so. Yeah. So I think there is absolutely a big place for collective ownership, cooperative ownership, um, uh, a re-energization, a re-energizing of the commons. Um, but um, but it has to be a kind of modern commons. I don't think we need to go back to kind of thinking about the old stuff, but uh, yeah, back into a kind of more modern. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's hugely important because ultimately uh, the individualization and the privatization of land has been one of the biggest, um, yeah, one of the biggest obstacles we've had to, to, to overcome. So bringing more of that back into the collective and common, I think is really important. Great, thank you, Duncan. Um, we had a question from Guy talking about um, how do we link this to to systemic change. Uh, Guy, would you like to ask your question, if you're about? Hi, yeah, can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I'd just like to thank all the speakers. I've really, really uh, kind of gained a lot from tonight, so thank you very much. Um, but I suppose what, from from my point of view, um, as quite a normal person in this, <laughs> uh, I suppose, I, I I can't help but feel like there's a massive decoupling between this, this, you know, this, this massive problem we have and, you know, the systemic change you're all saying we, we need and people's understanding of it. Like it, I think what my example would be, you know, plastic pollution, for example, you, you ask a normal person on the street, do they think plastic is a problem? They say, yes, you know, they say I'm recycling, I'm reusing a bottle, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And something like blue planet, which is a really big thing, obviously made that change, you know, whereas this feels very cliquey, um, obviously you're part of a think tank this is your job you know this is something that is it's it's not an everyday person's problem at the moment and how how you know clearly we you know we're on the people's land policy this is a seminar for them that that's that's one movement moving towards it but i don't know it, it just feels and am i back up the wrong tree is it in every person's problem should it mm -hmm. is it is it is it meant to be coming is it more likely to come from the top i don't know i know that's very vague but do you, do you see where i'm coming from it it just feels really oh. cliquey yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's and it's a it's such an important question, Guy, because absolutely, it's what I think we're all struggling with. Um, and indeed, in land reform, you know, there are no there are no new ideas. There, well, there are very, very few new ideas in there. Um, and so, yeah, it's all about creating the conditions for change. And I think that's what land reformers have been quite bad at doing for quite a long time. Part of it is the narrative, and indeed, um, I think share, uh, there's a great organisation called Shared Assets. Um, who produced a document around narratives around land and how off-putting some of the general frameworks that people talk about land. And so this is the historic injustice one, I think is one, I think, from what I remember reading about, uh, that, you know, that doesn't engage people um, as much as maybe some of the other ones we talked about, some of the more forward-looking ones. So I think one, we need to think about why we're doing land reform, about how we create messages and that, that really engage people because that also it also feels very technical it's very complicated um because it's such a you know wide and broad issue um and there are just so many issues with it so i think i think one that's off-putting there are you know i think solutions are often easier you know universal basic income i think you know as well as being a you know an interesting idea 
and it also holds the popular imagination because it's really easy to hold in your head uh, what it is. And despite it being quite quite radical, it, it kind of it, it times in with people. Whereas land reform, I think, is super abstract. Um, I don't think it really engages the average, the normal person, as you would say, guy. Um, uh, and that's really on us, I think, partly. Um, so I think us as kind of being part of a movement, we're trying to learn and trying to figure it out. But um, but um, so yes, yeah, so I don't really have the answer other than that we need to do a lot more work in this area. And I don't know, Oli, Sinead, you're more closer to the grounds. Like um, I know my, so my partner, she runs, she works for Sustain and she runs the cap Capital Growth which is a way of kind of creating a network of growing sites within London. And, and you know, so I think we need more of those kind of things, but, but yeah, that's probably, um, oh yeah, I don't know if you guys want to help me out here. As I flounder into the ground. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. It's, it's really hard. Um, I, I get quite cynical about a lot of, like conversations that we have where it's often you know are we just talking to the same people about the same problems and what are we actually doing I think that's probably why we need to actually start bringing a bit more of like the human experience to things and like how a situations or how this thing has affected someone on a personal level because then other people might be able to relate to that they might be able to see something that they didn't realize but their experience is linked to this common issue and I think the more that we yeah bring the conversation to the table that's around like honesty and around how these issues affect us I think that is a huge part of how we move this forward um and, and I think a lot of it's you know it's representation as well it's you know a lot of people don't really realize it's a problem because often what we see from like land and what we see from who owns land etc is often within a certain demographic and that's kind of accepted that those are the people that own land and it's just done that way but the more that that gets kind of challenged and the more that we see people that don't fit a certain demographic all the time doing things that we're not used to seeing them do even though they are doing it it is a fallacy that they're not um i think that will also help raise some questions in people's minds of just like oh i could be doing that so why aren't i doing that what are my barriers for that like why can't i do that why isn't that accessible to me and that's I think how we start bringing more people into the conversation from a wider range of places as well you know I think a lot of the time the access route into this conversation is through like food and food growing but you know this affects people that work with trees it affects people in floristry it affects people in so many other ways and it's just bringing them to the conversation too Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's all right. And I think obviously, it, if it wasn't difficult, we'd be further ahead than, than, than where we are. So I mean, I, I, I agree, there's a lot of issues around framing. Um, I think um, there's good cause to try and help Scotland uh, move forward in their uh, situation, because they are, d despite various flaws in their system, no doubt, they, they do have more of a debate there. And I think getting um, better policies in Scotland and then maybe Wales um, through whatever means is a, is a good way of bringing, of showing what's possible um, to people here. Cause partly it's about not believing that any other scenario is possible. We have to show that other, other possibilities are, are real. Um, we do have to look at how we talk about these issues and we have to find some, some sort of simple um, memes that people can relate to that, that are, <laughs> They relate to their lives, but are also uh, systemic. And that's really difficult. That's why it's easier to talk about plastic bags than it is about a systemic change, because systemic change by, by itself is generally complex, you know? So it's finding simple ways to do really big things is not easy. Um, but more people getting together and, and discussing it, I think is how we will work that out. I mean, and that's why I think it's really important that we, that we do have these conversations because I think the answers are out there in our communal and collective knowledge and understanding, uh, but we don't have a lot of forums to actually have these discussions. Certainly not on a community basis. I mean, if I, if I start talking to people on my estate in London about land reform, it absolutely, just think I'm mad. If I talk about housing problems, um, then people can access it, you know, and that relates to what I said right at the beginning about we're a very urban population and we've completely lost touch with various rural and, and land, as in 
sort of non-urban land issues. But also we shouldn't hide from the fact that, you know, all of all land reform, you know, underpins a kind of need to reduce the price of land. And we shouldn't kid ourselves that, you know, although land ownership is very concentrated, as I said at the beginning, you know, with our, you know, very small percentages, there is now a long tail of people that own a little bit of land. And, and so in fact, messing with land, you are messing with, what is it? It was 50% of people, you know, kind of own something. You're basically messing not only with where they live, but, you know, in the UK also your house, your property has become so much more. It's your pension fund. It's your rainy day fund in case you need care, you know? And so, uh, and that's why I think there's this deep seated psychology with, with anything that tries to mess with land prices um, because it does actually impact a much wider group. In theory, it should be, you know, yeah, if, if all we need to tackle is the 432 people and the 25,000 people in England, you know, and the 432 people in Scotland and all the reforms was only impacting them, it would be, it should be relatively easy to mobilize, you know, the 99.96% against the 0.04%. Uh, but um, but it's not because actually the people affected is, is much wider. And so uh, although I'm sure most people on this would love to see the price of land reduced, um, actually, there's a huge constituency out there that, that, is, that doesn't. Um, yeah. Right. yeah. Thank you very much. Ives. Can I just can I just say something else in, in yeah, response sure, as well? Ahead. Just. Um, that's going off what Marco said there. It's kind of, I suppose, what, what I'm getting at as well is is in the media. Um, is there any is there any leverage there? As in, and, and like obviously you kind of um, you you like yourself against the um, oh, sorry I've forgotten the name the Adam Smith oh, Institute yeah, of course the very very well known economic think yeah, tank the Adam you know Smith yeah the Adam Smith Institute and and I'm I'm not being harsh but like I hadn't heard of yourself your your think tank until until this seminar and obviously I'd, I'd very much heard of the Adam Smith Institute and that's 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 a media problem isn't it is it is there I don't know I I, I just I don't know I I, I don't have well, a point is, other I mean, than is there anything media wise that that as as part of your solution. Yeah, well, I mean, I think sadly for us, media is kind of part of the problem. And I think you could see that with the very modest tax proposals that Labour made uh, in, the, was it the last generation or the one before? I forget they all merge into one. Uh, and how, you know, all of the tabloids jumped on it as a massive intrusion, as a garden tax, as a, an attempt to kind of take away your castle, all this kind of stuff. Um, so, so no, and I think that plays, you know, and I don't want to, it's, it's easy to get quite conspiratorial about it all, and I don't want to go down that road too much, but, um, but there are certainly very powerful vested interests in this game, um, and um, who stand to lose a lot by land reform actually happening. And so, so yes, there are elements of the media that are interested, um, but I would say the majority, it's probably trying to manage the media so that they don't, uh, yeah, I mean, when you're dealing with radical land reform, it's really managing the media so that they um, even report it in a, um, in a, uh, just in a kind of true, true fashion. Um, I think um, George Monbiot speaks very interestingly. So George Monbiot wrote for the, the Labour Party, the Land for the Many report. Well, he edited it together. From a lot of other people's excellent contributions um, um, but what was interesting uh, as well as it being an excellent report which I urge everyone to look at who wants to see land reform as a systemic thing um, but George talks really eloquently about the complete and total disinterest that the media had in reporting it other than to basically lie about the contents um, so uh, I think that was a that kind of sealed it for me that it doesn't really matter what you write the the media is not going to be your friend in this one so so we need another route than than at least than the tabloid and established media which is obviously yeah right uh, thanks guys that's really interesting hand up did you want to contribute to the discussion what's up so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to comment on this, the fact that uh, most people don't understand about land. And I think that it depends how you talk about it. 
And the people, us, me, for example, and some of the others that are hosting this, I'm not involved in food and agriculture at all. I know nothing about it. How I got interested in land was through the housing issue. And if you talk to people in housing campaigns, anti-gentrification campaigns, you know, trying to stop your estate being demolished, the fact that there's no public places, the fact that, you know, there's no place for children to play, people are well aware of the issues of land. You know, people whose community center has been closed down uh, and all these issues are land issues. You know, so they, people do understand that environmental issues. People, uh, during the pandemic, the fact that we didn't have access to green spaces, you know, the fact that, you know, if you're rich, you've got a whole, the garden of England, you know, Surrey stockbroker belt, you can swan around in acres and acres of land. Whereas in London, people were packed into parks. People are aware of the land issues. And that's how, where it has to come from. All we have to do is translate these very real concerns of people on the ground into policies that people can relate to. And maybe this sounds difficult, I think this is what our job is. And, uh, and it's trying to bring all the different concerns together. And this is what's proven to be a little bit more difficult is because, and I, I said something in the chat, but we really do get different audiences depending on what our topic is. So I have been part of the Radical Housing Network, but a lot of the Housing Network people wouldn't come to something on food. You know, and if we did something on, on food, the on the on housing and we'll get the food people there so the point is we need that's why the land issue is something that can bring people together but we you have to start from the real issues that people are concerned about and then show how they are are all land issues and i think that really is our way forward and this is why i think in i think coming up i think we have a lot to learn also from what's going on in the global south and I've just been talking to someone today in Brazil who's going to speak at our fourth seminar, and she's going to talk about some absolutely amazing initiatives in Brazil about people to do with food, but not just food, to do with housing, to do with community, to do with people working together. So I think that hopefully in the next two seminars, we're going to try to find more ideas about how we can make the fight for land justice something that affects us all. And the next one is actually going to be on urban growing and peri-urban farming. And so many people are interested in that. So many, you know, we've had more signups for that one than any of the different seminars. So that it is a way in. We just got to show how it relates to land reform. And in the last seminar, bringing in some of these examples from, from, from the global south where really some fantastic things are happening. And I think we have a lot to learn here from what's going on elsewhere. Hello, oh, myself. Um, Marco, I see you've raised a hand. Would you like to contribute something? Yeah, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks. It's been a really, really interesting discussion. Great presentations as well this evening. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just building on kind of, I guess, the point that Guy raised earlier, which I think is really pertinent. Well, like one thing that kind of goes a thread through all the presentations today is that there's a real social aspect that lies at the heart of this. And sometimes there's a green movement, sometimes maybe neglect that a little bit. And, the, you know, the the um, principles of the environment may become a little bit above sometimes the principles of what we think about each other or the communities around us, etc. I think one thing that, so land is great in a, in a way to focus on that, but one thing about food in particular that's quite um, powerful is that at the end of the day, everybody sits down usually around a table and eats together. And it's whether that kind of, how to, to kind of get these messages out to communities, for example, I live in East London in Tower Hamlets. It's a very dense area of London, lots of, you know, pockets of, of deprivation, also some very significant pockets of very rich areas too. But it's how do we kind of connect with the grassroots on these issues, not necessarily overtly on a political basis or on a systemic change basis, basis even though, you know, that's what we're all after at the end of the day, but to talk to the regular Joe on the street about these things in a way that they kind of understand, you know, maybe some options that are available, how to get involved and yeah, like kind of to connect with the grassroots, I suppose at the end of the day is what I'm trying to get in, trying to get into. So does anybody have any thoughts on that or have they had any experiences on, on those kind of um, getting out 
in terms of talking to people about these issues on a, ground, on a grassroots level. Yeah, I mean, I mean um, the thing I was doing in Scotland, we, we, we thought a lot about because we didn't want to be too, we wanted to provide like a menu of options, but we also didn't want to be too prescriptive because ultimately that never really works. And so the kind of the middle ground that we ended up looking towards was um, spent a lot of time thinking about citizens' assemblies and whether that offers any way forward in this. And I think actually, it, it, it actually could be quite attractive. Um, so, you know, locally based citizens' assemblies, you know, you could have a Tower Hamlet one, I'm just across in Hackney, so we could have the Hackney one. Um, and it would be a way, you know, so how a citizens' assembly work is, you know, 100 or X number of people would be chosen at random, similar to kind of jury service style. Um, and then would be paid to come together where uh, experts would come not to kind of make decisions but to help inform them so they'd get a series of presentations a bit like here although it would be much more neutral than some of the you know um than what we've done and then it would be up to the these people to then kind of work through the issues and decide and i think for me maybe you know land is possibly an issue that you know a citizen assembly a kind of distributed network of citizens assemblies might be really well suited to one just getting everybody comfortable talking about land and why it's important to them because as you as people have said i think everybody would have a story about like how it impacts them or somebody they know or, or something of importance um but then more importantly also gets everybody talking about what's the next step what are the changes get some buy-in for those so so I mean that's an area that I'm really interested in um in Scotland again depending on how the election goes in May that's potentially a real option for how the debate's going to kind of move forward in in Scotland and and I think yeah I think that's a kind of interesting one I haven't heard too many others that give me an bar like oh let's just set up a local group you know the food farming and countryside commission that I mentioned they set up like a, a Devon inquiry and things like that to bring people together to share stories and then to disseminate those stories back out so that local places had local input and then relevant stories but um yeah so I think it's it's kind of things like that that I feel we need more of but you know they are complicated to organize uh, relatively expensive um and you know and with an uncertain outcome so uh yeah um but yeah those, those are the kind of things I like Hey, thank you, Duncan. Um, I see it's nine o'clock now, so I feel like we should uh, begin to perhaps wrap up. Uh, Bonnie, did you want to uh, say any final comments? Um, no, I think Richard was going to finish off. Boris, Richard, are you there? Thanks, Bonnie. I don't know about finish off, but I can uh, <laughs> I can I can say something short. Uh, <laughs> So I, I, I'm Richard, I, I'm a member of the uh, People's Land Policy uh, Working Group and we're all from community groups. We, uh, you know, as, bon as Bonnie mentioned, we, we, we do have connections at a grassroots popular level and that's really critical to what we're about. But I think the issue is that we, ha we must scale up. We've, re we've really got to uh, link up many different groups more effectively and we need people like yourselves uh, to join us so i think the the appeal really at the end is that we we urgently need land reform and please consider joining one of the organizations that you've heard about today whether that's the land workers alliance whether it's lion that Sinead mentioned the work of New Economics Foundation or our work in people's land policy. Um, we really need to strengthen the networks that exist um, if we're to build a, a radical bottom up uh, movement for land reform. So I noticed there was some, some discussion in chat about setting up a media group. And obviously every initiative is, uh, is, is really good, but, uh, but if you form a media group, please link up with these other existing networks as well, because we, we, we need that solidarity between the different networks. Um, the final message really is that we've produced a draft people's land policy and we very much want to make, make sure it is popular and to get more comments and feedback from you. 
So if you haven't looked at it already, it's uh, it's on our website, um, which I think has been mentioned in chat. And please please have a look at it and contribute um, so that so that we can provide the kind of detail that's going to appeal to a broad number of people at the grassroots level. I think we we will send out some information after today's seminar. So there'll be an opportunity there to sign up for things um, and to make comments that way. Um, and for those of you who are really uh, inspired on the policy side of, of land reform, please consider joining us um, and helping us to make the people's land policy um, a stronger document and one that has uh, considerable support at the, at the grassroots level. Well, I guess there's nothing more to say, but uh, well, hope that you might attend some of our other meetings, but even more important, as Richard said, that you get involved in the whole idea of land reform, wherever you are, whether it be through a food lens, a housing lens, environment or community, that you're thinking about how that all comes together under the umbrella of land reform. So I guess that's the formal end to it. Thanks, all.